Guys, believe it or not, spelling does make a difference. If you don't spell stuff right, people aren't gonna understand what you mean sometimes. But what's worse than that is, it makes you look like a dope, okay? We all have typos here and there from time to time. Uh, it's gonna happen. But some, for some people, it happens all the time, way too much. Um, like whoever put the, you know, whoever put the billboard up there, big mistake. Uh, these pictures are from Mike Casey, by the way. They're not mine. Uh, this one, check your spelling, guys. It says whole house, shit off instead of whole house, shut off. I was just reading it. If your, in well, if your inspection software doesn't have a spell checker, uh -huh. spelling check or use an online spell checker. And you want to give at least a little thought to what you're trying to convey to your client. Um, since you're doing the inspection, you're trying to relay information to them. Um, some of you guys don't have the client with you. A lot of us take the, the client with us and they get information right there. They get it again in the report. So when you're trying to convey information to your client through a report, if they weren't tagging along with you on the inspection, you need to be able to convey that information in a manner that they can understand what's going on. Do you want assorted crackers or do you want ass crackers? You know, they can't convey the information about this special here that they thought they were conveying. Um, Again, <laughs> yeah, they needed a hyphen and where the hyphen went in that uh, subject line there, that heading would depend on what was going on, right? This is about mentoring. So it's the first job experience. Why don't we go backwards? Little things like a hyphen can make a big difference. Now you report a defect is just as important as finding the defect, okay? You've gotta be able to get that information to the client properly. Um, sometimes, People just can't seem to quite get their thoughts into the computer and get them to come out right. Um, when something's unclear, the client is not gonna get it. The agent's not gonna get it. How many of you have had a situation where the agent comes back with something that you put in your report, they come back to you with, is this what they need to fix? Or is this how they need to fix it? And they've got it totally wrong. It's not even remotely what you said. It went from your report to the buyer's agent, to the listing agent, and all of a sudden it comes back and you're looking at it like, that's not what I said. You know, it doesn't even remember what, resemble what I said. So you can have these confusing narratives. Um, so this guy starts with his typo, the first word outbuildings. <laughs> then he gets really confusing here. Outbuildings are not, normally not a part of a home inspection. Any inspection of an outbuilding, should there be one on site, is strictly for the convenience of the client. A thorough inspection is not included nor accomplished with this inspection. What's the guy trying to say here? Um, I think the way this works is if you look at an outbuilding, you're, you're inspecting it and you need a report on it. Um, 
But then he confuses everybody with the thorough inspection is not included. So what are you doing? Are you doing a halfway inspection or what? Um, then he goes on about comments concerning the outbuilding and for your information, not part of the inspection. But if you looked at it, it's part of the inspection. Keep your comments as brief and concise as possible. Um, I, I don't know who's got the record for the longest report. I had an agent print one out, it was 350 pages. And let me tell you, it was like writing a book. It was a lot of buildings on an old property. But still, it's a good idea to avoid repetition. So you look at, you look at this statement in this report, water is not functional. What does that say to you? The water's broken, it doesn't work, it's defective. What's wrong with the water? Go a little further here. The tub shower faucet was not functional during the inspection. Okay, so it's the valve that's not functional. It's not the water. During the inspection, hopefully people know that you were there during the inspection and you don't have to tell them again, right? That should be somewhere in your intro or your contract or something that the inspection is snapshot in time, blah, blah. So the faucet was not functional, rendering the tub and shower inoperable. Well, he already said it wasn't functional. Do you have to say it's also inoperable? Uh, what makes the tub inoperable? It doesn't hold water. It leaks, it's rusted through or whatever. So the tub is probably fine. He just can't get any water in it. Um, recommended have a professional plumber evaluate and repair. But somebody reading this might not be able to figure out what's going on. Heating system. It's located in the basement. It's a heat pump, it's electric, it's a Linux. It's six years old. Cooling system, it's outside on the left side of the house. It's a heat pump, it's electric, it's Linux. It's six years old. You probably wouldn't have to say all that twice. Then when you get down to the heating system, the inspection is limited because the inspector operates the heat pump in heating mode only. The heat pump is not inspected because for cooling because the outside temperature is too low would be better. If the compressor operates in one mode, it's the same as operating in the opposite mode. Okay, if it operates in heat, it probably operates in cooling. If it operates in cooling, it probably operates in heat. But the compressor can run and the reversing valve might not work. You might switch the thermostat to cool and it stays in heat, vice versa. So just because it's running in one mode doesn't mean it will run in the other mode. And then he repeats the same thing again. Inspection is limited because outside temperature is too low, blah, 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 blah. So he's just like repeating all this stuff here. And it just adds to the amount of stuff in the report. Everybody wants to recommend. And this is the version of recommend that they're using right here. Advise someone to do something. Well, what are you trying to convey to the buyer? Is something broken? Does it need to be fixed? Well, if it's broken, it needs to be fixed. Why don't you just say it's broken? It needs to be fixed. Why? Well, I recommend this, and I recommend that, recommend this, recommend that. I've seen reports with recommend in almost every single line. We'll just say what the problem is and say what to do about it. And you find a defect, what do you do? Is something broken? Does it need to be fixed? Does it need to be replaced? Best thing to do is say, fix it or replace it, whichever one's appropriate. Or you can say it needs to be repaired or replaced. 
Oh. You want to avoid excessive use of boilerplate. Um, there are phrases some people will use repeatedly in their report that just adds the length of the report, but doesn't really add to the value of the report. So it appeared to be this, appeared to be that. Well, is it or isn't it? You know, if a, if a TPR valve is dripping, it's dripping. It doesn't appear to be dripping. You got a leak, you need to replace the TPR valve. If a window is clouded, it has a broken seal. It doesn't appear to have a broken seal. This guy was looking at framing, okay? The floor framing appeared functional. Areas of the mud sill appeared functional. Areas of the floor joist appeared functional. Support beams appeared functional. So basically what he's saying is the house wasn't collapsing. Everything was working. Well, why can't you just say it's all inspected and somewhere in your uh, contract or somewhere in the intro, it says what inspected means. It means it was okay. It means it's working as intended. And then you don't have to put all this other stuff in the report. It just adds to the report, but doesn't add to the value of the report. It's one of the most overused phrases I've seen in inspection reports. It is recommended that. Um, if you're there doing an inspection and you're recommending all the different trades come in and check everything out after you, what are you doing? What value are you providing for your for your buyer? Um, you're there to do the inspection and tell them what's wrong with the house. So here, exhaust fan is not. Whoops, exhaust fan is not functional. Does everybody know what this device is? Yeah, it's an air everybody knows this is not an exhaust fan. Okay. This guy didn't know that this is not an exhaust fan. He says the exhaust fan is not functional. Well, it's not an exhaust fan, it's an air freshener. Um, again, during, not functional during the inspection. And he's recommending an electrician. I don't, the picture that went with this statement was so bad I couldn't do anything with it. But what I can tell you is that it was good enough that I could look at the picture and see that the problem wasn't the window, the problem was condensation on the window. So that's a problem with too much moisture in the living space in the house. And you need to address that and not address a window that maybe appears to be faulty, when in truth, you're, you need to look at humidity levels in the house. Is accuracy important? Uh, probably. Take time to review your reports. And it will probably help your credibility score if you actually know what you're commenting on, if you know what you're talking about. The receptacle is located in or near a wet area outside, so that would be wet, no doubt. But the switch doesn't have a weather cover. So we start with a receptacle, and all of a sudden we're at a switch. Well, what switch is he talking about? It's not in the picture. There's nothing resembling a switch there. <laughs> so accuracy is important. You want to address the problem, call it the right thing, it's a receptacle outlet, outlet, and it does need a weather, weatherproof, I believe is the word that they use, weatherproof cover. The inspection is limited because the windows are locked, not operated. I think most of us walk up to a crescent latch at a window, flip it and open the window. That's 
a choice this inspector makes to not flip the crescent latch and open the window, I guess. <laughs> and he says it twice. Inspection is limited because the windows are not operated. They're not operated because they're locked. Um, I don't know if that's very helpful for the person buying the house. Yeah, some of those, some of those old, some of the old ones had a funky key and that company went out of business, keys no longer available, but I have one if you need it, somewhere. Stuck in my pocket, it never made it back to that house. <laughs> and they did complain and I said, you know, just take the things out and throw them away. Keys no longer available. Okay, the dishwasher is built in. I don't know about other states, but I think in Virginia, your contract, according to the law, you're supposed to check built-in appliances. You don't have to check appliances that are not installed. Well, you would kind of assume that a dishwasher is built in unless you say something in your report about, take a picture of it, this is a portable dishwasher. I didn't check it. It's not installed. It's not built in. Um, The dryer is electric. The laundry space includes a three wire plug. Check your dryer to ensure that connection is compatible. 200 volt, there's a 240 volt electrical receptacle for the dryer. There is no gas line. Well, if there's no dryer there, you can just say there's an electric rough end or there's electric outlet for a dryer. That's all you have to say. You don't have to comment on the gas line. So again, he's adding superfluous information. It doesn't add anything to the substance of the report. Electrical service, left side, aluminum, underground, two amp, 200 amps. You don't need the sand coming. Which direction is that current going? It's coming from the transformer going to the Transform. Panels in the basement, it has circuit breakers, it's 200 amps, 120, 240 volt panel. Branch circuits, copper, stranded aluminum. Have any of you ever seen stranded aluminum circuits, branch circuits in a panel? Branch circuits, not major circuits, branch circuits. Anybody? Branch, a branch circuit, not, not an appliance circuit, branch circuit, general lighting, stranded aluminum. I've never seen it. I don't think it exists. We have stranded for major stuff, stranded aluminum, service cable, major equipment, major appliances, not a problem. Accuracy is important. The insurance company is going to talk to this buyer about insuring their house and they're going to say, what kind of wiring do you have? The buyer is going to read this report. Somebody at an insurance company is going to flip out and say, no, we're not going to insure your house. You've got this aluminum wiring. Um, so it is important to make sure you get the right thing in your report. This one, further down in here. GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupts. Shut off power if the amount of current returning to the circuit is not the same as the electricity flowing into the circuit. Well, that's not a really good explanation there. I don't think it's kind of confusing because the current isn't returning to the circuit. It's actually returning to the transformer out there on the pole. Again, I've never heard of stranded aluminum branch circuits. I don't think they exist. Water service line. It's at the front, but we don't know what it's at the front of yet. The inspector is unable to determine, I guess he's unable to determine what the water service line is made of. He does say it's public water supply and the interior supply pipes are copper. Drain waste vent, PVC, public sewer, that's all standard. Um, 
water heater, Whirlpool interior. So guys, if there's a spa tub or something in the house, that's usually what's in the house. If it's a hot tub, it's outside the house. There's a difference between the two. Whirlpool is connected to plumbing. Hot tub is not. You fill it with a hose. It's connected to electricity. Um, the water heater is 14 years old. It's past the end of its useful, useful life. So past the end of useful life would indicate there's a problem with it. Either it's not heating the water anymore, and no, no intelligent plumber would change um, elements on a water heater that old because next thing that goes wrong, the plumber owns it. It's past the end of expected service life, but it's not leaking, it's still heating water. There's nothing wrong with it. But he's saying it's past the end of its useful life. Um, we get to his next comment, though. And guess what? We have a plastic water service. But he wasn't able to determine in the previous slide, he says. Unable, <clears throat> unable to determine. And there it is for the whole world to see it's plastic. He says the water service entry pipe is corroded. I don't think plastic corrodes. Uh, some forms of plastic probably oxidize somehow or other, but I don't think they corrode. This is a problem. Now we know where the location is though. Now we know it's at the front of the basement because we took information from two different statements and put it together. It could all be in one statement, front foundation wall, boom, you're done. Um, <clears throat> this may permit water penetration. Now, when I look at this picture, I go over here, this looks like mineral buildup over here coming down the copper pipe. Well, that makes me think there's something above this connection that's leaking. Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff below the clamps, two clamps here, one here, one here, a little bit of stuff down here, but there's also stuff coming from above. Um, but he wants the buyer or someone to replace the service pipe. That can be a bit expensive. I would think maybe worst case, you might need two new clamps there, or maybe just tighten a packing nut or something or replace a valve above, stop the leak. So look closely at this stuff and say, you know, try to figure out what's going on. If you're doing, if you do these quick inspections, you're there an hour and a half or two hours and you're just running through real fast, you're gonna miss some of this stuff. You have to look at these items, these things while you're in the house. And then when you're doing your report and you're sitting there looking at the picture, a lot of times you'll find more stuff that's in your pictures that you didn't see when you were doing the actual inspection. This one, just a minute, excuse me. Um, this one starts out with the inspector shall inspect, and it goes on to list everything the inspector shall inspect. We get to H, the inspector shall inspect panel boards. How do you inspect a panel board? Take the cover off, right? Look, at least look inside. <clears throat> then we get down, halfway down here, a little more than halfway down, the inspector is not required to remove the panel board cover or the dead front. So we start out being, you know, having to inspect it, the inspector shall inspect, and we get a little further down, and no, this inspector is not required to. So what is this trying to tell, you, tell the buyer? Um, do you think this causes confusion? Did the guy open the panel? Didn't he open the panel? Did he inspect it? Did he not inspect it? Was he supposed to? Was he not supposed to? What's going on? 
You don't know. Accuracy is important. <clears throat> this one. Gaps between foundation and framed wall. Where's the foundation, usually? Anybody? Where's the foundation? Downstairs, down below, in the basement, slab, wherever. If you look at this picture, what are you looking at? The sky. So there's no foundation here, but the comment is referencing gaps between the foundation and the framing, and the picture is showing you gaps in the sheathing, and you can even see that there are uh, hurricane ties up there, so we know that that's the roof, and we see the sky and we see above the trees, so we know we're nowhere near the foundation, but he's showing, he's saying gaps between the foundation. <laughs> we need to do better, people. Um, if you're going to talk about the foundation, put in a picture of the foundation. If there are gaps there, if the gaps are not in the foundation, if they're up on the second floor, say they're on the second floor. Don't confuse people. Attic insulation, 6.3, inspected. But it's marginal. Um, there's a couple of pictures coming up later that show the rest of the attic. There's no insulation. This is pre drywall, NRS. There's no insulation in this attic, in this house yet. But he's saying he inspected it and he's saying it's marginal. It's not even there, right? Right, right. There is a standard receptacle installed in a location that currently requires a GFCI device. Make sure you know if you work in Virginia that people can renovate a kitchen, they're not required to install GFIs. If the house is a 1943 house, they don't have to put GFIs in. Make sure you know that. Um, currently requires GFCI. Yeah, new construction, yes. Older houses, no. So um, what do you say um, a best practice? Oh, absolutely. From a safety standpoint, you want to tell people, yeah, wasn't required when the house was built, not required now. Best thing to do is to say, go ahead and install GFCIs, GFIs. Absolutely. Uh, I just threw this in the middle here, kind of. I thought it was interesting. And this is from a couple different reports, a few different reports. Are you doing an, are you there to do an inspection? Are you there to, you're working for your buyer. You're working for the buyer. They're paying you to do the inspection. Are you there to sell them stuff? Some reports are peppered with random services the inspector can sell or give to their clients. I refuse to play that game. I'm there to do the absolute best inspection I can. And for no other reason, I don't deal with any of this. You can get a free ring video doorbell with a free security system installation. You can get all kinds of stuff, uh, warranties for wires, pipes, <clears throat> personal concierge, connect all your home services, it's all free. They're all data mining. All of them. <clears throat> they just want to get hold of your clients and sell them stuff. And if your report is only 21 pages to begin with, and four pages are things you're selling, your report, then you have an intro page, and you probably have a uh, an invoice there or something, then your report is coming down to less than 20 pages. That's pretty slim, I think. Then 
you know, I call it filler when people can't find enough things wrong with the house that they have to start just throwing stuff in a report. So there'll be like loads of pictures of whatever's in the house, appliances. It could be NRS construction. It could be 25 pictures of roof trusses. So when you're looking at a picture of roof truss and the picture's only this big in the report, what do you really see? You don't see much. You're not helping the client with this. You're just making your report longer to make it look like you're doing something, okay? This report had lots of pictures, stuff that's in houses. Well, the person buying the house can see that stuff. You know, it's not like they need to pay you to give them a picture of the stuff that's in the house. They can see it when they go look at the house. They can see it when they're at the inspection. They can see it when they move in. It's all there. They don't need pictures of it. But there you go. Picture the wall oven, picture the inside of the wall oven. And I thought this comment was interesting because we're in the kitchen and all of a sudden we're doing laundry here and we go to dryer vents. Well, we do see some kitchens that have the laundry in them. Usually condos have a stack washer and dryer. Some of them, well, that's all they have. It's in the kitchen or next to the kitchen or behind the closet door in the kitchen. But most homes don't have the washer and dryer in the kitchen. I guess this guy thought that was a good place to put washer and dryer. So uh, I do have a company now right there. Just the microphone, the microphone. Uh, <coughs> so one thing I have to share about that one is that I take plenty of pictures. And uh, one of the reasons is in the past I've had uh, clients come back to me a month or two later and says, well, you didn't inspect the dishwasher. Right, so I do take a picture of the dishwasher with the controls on and making sure that it operated. I'm not always putting it on the report, but I want them to understand that that's part of my inspection protocol. And that you know, there are many other things in the house that I'm taking pictures of that it's like absurd. You know, am I taking a picture of this for what? But at the end of the day, it's just that it's part of my protocol so that the client knows I touch it, I inspect it, and uh, you know, it's documented because. Clients will come back later on after, you know, 30 days settlement and uh, move in and something is wrong and it's my fault, right? I was there 45 right. days ago. Right. No, absolutely. You're right. I also take lots of pictures, but I don't put them in the report. You know, I'm not, I take pictures of everything, but I put the problems in the report. I don't just put pictures in the report to show you what your wall oven looks like on the outside and the inside. What's the point of that? That doesn't really, that's no benefit to the client. It just makes your report look like you're doing something. When in reality, you're just showing them a picture of something they can look at it any day. Twenty-five pictures of attic trusses. They were small, but they added five pages to the report to make it look like there's some substance there. No. What do you think that does for a client? I mean, this is much bigger than the client would see it, right? It's only this big on my screen. What's the guy doing? He's not really there's no benefit to having these pictures in here. And there were a lot of them, like I said, it was five pages. This one, different one, I think. So he's got his attic picture. Got a picture of the foundation from the outside. Picture of the foundation from the inside. He says right there, foundation, foundation, structure, foundation. No, what is this a picture of? Insulation, right. It's the insulation covering the wall. You don't see the foundation from the inside. What's this a picture of? Drywall. It's covering the foundation wall. You don't see the foundation wall from the inside. So if you're dealing with structure and foundation, are you gonna show pictures 
that show you what you can't see? Or are you gonna say that, you know, we've got insulation, we've got drywall, we can't see the foundation wall? That would be a much better thing to say. Um, these pictures, you could make them bigger, they would open in a brand new window and get big, but you still can't see the foundation. Um, and you need to tell your buyer, you know, we can see some of the foundation on the outside. And if they're with you, of course, they're gonna see it too. But we can't see any of it on the inside because the basement's insulated and finished. There's no foundation accessible inside the home. Filler, what are you showing? What are you showing the buyer? I do take pictures of data tags. I've never had anyone ask for them. Uh, but what are we showing? We're showing them the furnace. It's there in their utility room. They don't need a picture of it. Do they care what the, what's behind the furnace cover? The inside of it? They don't care. Um, down here's the blower. And down there, I do take a picture but I, I take a picture inside the blower so I can see how dirty it is. Uh, Jim, the one thing I would say is that if it only takes up a picture of the furnace and the data tag, that the, what it, it serves the purpose of showing them what it is they're looking at. Because I've found that a lot of people, people don't even understand what they're looking at or understanding how the uh, HVAC system oftentimes will have you know, a separate you know, indoor uh, air handler for the air conditioning and then the, the furnace with the backboard. So I don't know, it just seems that it, it's not, doesn't take up a lot of space to help document and help them understand what it is that you've been examining. So you just explained all that, but pretend you're a buyer who doesn't know anything about a house. What do you know when you look at that? If you don't know that's a furnace, you don't know what it is. And you don't know anything else about it. And you won't know any more about it by looking at that picture. Do I, do I operate furnaces? Hell yeah. Do I take a picture of the flames on? Oh yeah, of course I do. It's like I turn the oven broiler on, take a picture of the broiler. Yeah, was it red? Oh yeah, it was red, it worked. Um, years ago, Got done with an inspection to DC, a row house. The agent locked the door, left. I'm standing there on the front stoop with the buyer. She looked at me and she said, you didn't check the furnace. I said, hold on a minute. Pulled my camera out of my pocket, turned it on, started backing up through the pictures. Got to the one that shows the burner tubes with the blue flames. Here you go. I checked the furnace, you didn't pay attention. So yeah, take lots of pictures, absolutely. Because even if people are right there with you, if they're not paying attention, they're not gonna know what you checked. They're gonna question you. Uh, and you go, I'm gonna at least say that it's not there. Right. You know, right. so you can't inspect it, but you do need to at least comment that it hasn't been done yet. And once it's done, it needs to be inspected. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Same thing. Yeah. So there is some stuff, but hey, windows, doors, garage doors, garage door openers, insulation. That stuff just hasn't made it there yet, right? So do you have to... say all that in your report and have probably not. So at a pre drywall, are you only commenting on uh, installations that are complete? Or do you comment on ones that are, you know, incomplete, you know, the, the roofing isn't completed, it's it started, but it's not completed. For example, they've got the underlayment up and they haven't shingled. Well, no, they've they've got the uh, shingles on uh, maybe the main roof but they haven't done the garage or the porch or they've got the shingles on but the 
plumbing vent pipe boot flashings are missing. Right. Those go later, right? Um, so how much, how much incomplete stuff do you end up with in your report then? I mean, where do you draw the line? Uh, some of this stuff, yeah. Your fire stop, sometimes yeah. half the fire stop is done, sometimes half the air stop is done, but not yeah. the other half. Well, how much do you afford of what's not there? It's a lot of times it's, you know, the fire stopping's incomplete, have it finished. Uh, but when you find one or two spots in, they're marked and defective. Uh, but how much you know, it, it depends sometimes you show up and there's almost nothing complete and then i you know i'm going to list the electrical installations not complete have it finished and, and inspected but hey the builder hadn't got it done he should have let you know that you need to come later right so somewhere at the beginning of that report i'm going to say the house is not ready for pre-drywall right. yes and actually, I don't even like pre drywall because it should be pre insulation. Because people get mixed up there and they think, oh, pre drywall, and you get to the house, all the insulation's in. What, what do you see? Not much. Yeah. So, yeah, some stuff, but how far do you take that? Um, garage door, not present. Well, yeah, house isn't there yet. Garage door opener not installed at the time of the inspection. Well, yeah. I didn't read that entire report word for word. I didn't see anything that wouldn't be dealt with in the process of finishing that house. You know, it was just like this report was all about stuff that wasn't there and not so much about stuff that was there that maybe wasn't right. Okay. That's all I have about um, report writing. And I think the important thing that you want to take away is think about what you're putting in your report, how you're wording stuff. Are you wording it in such a way that people can understand, get the meaning that you're trying to convey to them? Um, try to keep your reports as short as possible, adding extra information. So when I started at Home Pro back in the 80s, yeah, you're supposed to tell people how many BTUs the furnace is, how many BTUs the water heater is, how many tons the air conditioner is, BTUs. Do people really care about that? It just adds stuff to the report that is, isn't really needed. How many of you put in furnace BTUs? Less than half. Yeah. No. No. It's not required by, it's not in any standard of practice that I know of. And what are buyers going to do with that information? Time to replace the furnace. They call whoever they call, Burr or Michael and Son or somebody. They get, you know, they're replacing a 30 year old furnace. They're going to get a new oversized furnace because those guys don't care about what they're putting in. They just say, oh, it's 80,000 BTUs. We'll put another 80,000 BTU when they probably need 60 by now because the windows have been replaced. The insulation has been upgraded. They probably don't need that big of a furnace anymore. So I don't think that. The only time I think I've said anything about that is when AC is way oversized, like 3,000 square foot house, five ton air conditioner. Okay, that's a problem. But other than that, that's information that's it's just not relevant, really. Well, if it's undersized. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen undersized. The question was, what if it's undersized? And I don't think I've ever seen undersized. 
Okay. Some of, some of you guys work in Virginia and Maryland. And I got these from Shane. I'm not going to go through these line by line because this is a whole separate seminar. We're going to flip through these, take a look at them, but we're not going to read every line. Trust me. There's a lot here. The important thing here is that you need to know the law in your state. If you work in Virginia only, you need to know the law in Virginia. If you work in Virginia and Maryland, you need to know the law in both states. And it's different. If you're a member of ASHI, InterNACHI, whatever, whose SOP do you perform to? ASHI or Virginia or Maryland? It's Virginia or Maryland. A lot of the Virginia SOP was taken from the ASHI SOP. I don't know what Maryland did. Make sure you know your state laws regarding required language in your contract and your inspection reports. If a complaint is filed against you in Maryland, Virginia or Maryland, your contract and your report will be examined closely and thoroughly by an investigator. And I'm not sure about Maryland, but I know in Virginia, anybody can file a complaint against you. It can be a pissed off realtor. It can be a pissed off builder. It could be the person who lives next door to the house you inspected. It can be anyone. It can be another inspector. They are gonna, the investigator is gonna tear your report up. They're going to be looking at it very closely. Anything required that's missing, any, there's stuff that's required in the report. It's all spelled out in Virginia law. Anything required that's missing can and probably will result in a fine, possibly temporary suspension of your license. It's up to you to know the law. The law does change from time to time. Um, the, next change is, the next change that's coming up is the smoke detector change, I think, at some point in the next few years, a couple, three years, probably. Is that right, Alex? I said, <laughs> I said, the law does change from time to time, and you got to keep up with the law. And I think the next one that's coming up is the smoke detector law. That is correct. Yeah, but it's at some point in the, some point in the future, that law will change, and that changes home inspector requirements. In Virginia, it's 18 VAC 15. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, if you're a Novashi member, all this is in your downloads. You can go on the website, log into your profile. This whole presentation is in your downloads. It's right there. You can refer to it anytime you want. Um, and all this stuff spells out who can do inspections. You know, are you competent? Are you professional? Do you have enough education? Do you have enough experience? Thinking back to some of the slides we saw earlier, probably not enough education, probably not enough experience. Um, Maryland is a little shorter here than Virginia is. But when you get into this other stuff, you look at ASHI, probably sort of the same stuff here. Then you look at Maryland, Maryland has more. Then you go here, Virginia has more than ASHI, but Maryland has less than Virginia. So these two states and the organizations, the inspector associations are totally different on what they're saying you should do. This is all SOP. And this, when you read through it, these actually tell you what you're supposed to check, how you're supposed to check it, how you're supposed to report on it. Contract specifications. 
ASHE has no contract specifications. Maryland has no contracts, no specific language requirements for the contract. Virginia does. All right. So I would imagine that there are plenty of guys in Virginia who are still using uh, outdated software. I know that several years ago, some were still using paper. And I know that their paper reports didn't have any of the Virginia required stuff in them. Um, here again, if anybody files a complaint, that's going to come up. The investigator will look at the, the contract and the report and see what's missing and you know, get slapped with a small fine and you have to go fix all your stuff anyway. It's better just to go ahead and keep it up to date, know the law, and stick with it. And this is all pretty basic. Contract clearly specifying terms, conditions, limitations, and exclusions of work to be performed. At a minimum, the written contract shall include name, business, your name, business name, business address, telephone number, license number, NRS if you have it, cost of the home inspection. So I'm, I might be in violation there, I don't know. I attached the invoice to the contract, so it's all right there together. Um, a listing of all areas and systems to be inspected, including those inspections that are either partial or limited in scope. A statement in the contract that the home inspection does not include a review for compliance with regulatory requirements. Virginia USBC, further codes, regulations, laws, ordinances, etc. Um, then they go on. There's more. You have to have all this in your contract somehow. So when when we got licensed, I know that I went through went online, got all this stuff, I copied and pasted it. I modified some of the language, but I kept it basic. The, the intent is still the same, but it's all in there. And it does add to the length of the contract. Um, how many of you How many of you talk about remaining life of any system or component? Very few. Yeah. I think probably all I do with that is say high probability replacement or it's past the end of expected service life, but it's still working, something like that. I don't. Um, how about uh, cost of cure? Methods, materials, or cost of correction. I don't think anybody wants to go there. Okay. Of course, Christian. Try again. Okay. So, yeah, Richmond Realtors, RAR, the contract stipulates cost of cure shall be provided. It doesn't say who has to provide it. It doesn't say the home inspector has to. It just says it has to be provided. Which, in a better world, would indicate that the realtor should contact contractors to get these estimates, right? I'm not an estimator. I'm not going to sit down with a means guide and start going through and this is this much and this is that much. And of course, if you did that, it would scare people half to death because um, an electrician can get $45 for every receptacle he replaces and $145 for every breaker, stuff like that. Um, I have a niece whose dad was a home inspector, but he's not licensed anymore. It's down in Richmond. 
their first house is fairly small in a subdivision. They all have crawl spaces down there for some reason. They haven't figured out how to build on a slab yet, I guess. Um, and the crawl space was a mess, had water running through it. The HVAC systems down there, vapor barrier incomplete, all kinds of stuff wrong. I didn't go in, I made my little brother go in. It was his daughter's house, it seemed appropriate to me. The air handler was behind this huge massive boulder. It's hard to get to. Um, and the realtor came back to me with, I need, a, I need an estimate to fix this crawl space. I'm like, sure, I'll give you one. Ten, how about $10,000? Just throw a number out there. The second house they bought, she and her husband bought, same realtor. They're hiring this dope again. We get done with the inspection. We're standing on the front porch. He said, I need cost estimates. I said, okay. And my, my niece and her husband were there. I said, okay, you're the realtor here. Put on your big boy pants, call contractors, get your estimates. You're not getting them from me. That was it. My niece's husband about fell off the porch. I said that, but hey, I didn't care about this realtor. I thought he was dope. Go ahead. So just a um, couple statements and questions here on this. This is Shane talking, by the way. Um, and are you going to be covering a little bit later? Because I know you're doing an abridged version of this a little bit. Are you going to be covering the um, the fact that like there's so much in the ASHI SOP that says we don't do this, we don't do that, that's not covered on this little A through K? Because it's just a statement to the people listening in the room and online. This A through K doesn't cover it. For the amount of stuff that we exclude as home inspectors, if you look at ASHI SOP, and you look at the, in the, um, this whole comparison, which can be downloaded from the website, there is a lot more that we don't do. Um, for example, just a real simple one that's not on here, right? Solar panels sitting on top of the roof. Well, septic tanks, right? If you don't, if those aren't things that you're inspecting, according to Virginia, it has to be excluded in the contract. Uh, when Jim and I spent quite a bit of time refining from the how much ASHI SOP has excluded, and it, some of it is kind of like, well, duh, we're not doing, we're not there for that, right? But when it says for what, what's in the ASHI SOP for what's excluded, and you compare that to what Virginia has here and what Virginia says about what you have to exclude, it's about a page and a half at a 10.5. So just a heads up for those that haven't really looked at over very well. Yeah, these yeah these these documents are different, but you got to know what's there, and you got to know what you've got to put into your contract and your report. It's very important. Your contract is what sets expectations for your client. They don't read it. How long is your contract? About seven pages. If you print it out. About seven pages. If you print it, yeah. right? I mean, looking at it on a computer, you just sort of scroll through it. Yeah, so my contract is about seven pages printed. And it's um, because, it, you know, like I said, a page and a half is, I joke around with it. I'm like, here's my marketing. Here's a page and a half what I don't do. Yeah. <laughs> but in it, before that part of what I don't do, I do have the part of what I do do. <laughs> what is an inspection? What is it, what's the scope of it? Right. What are we doing for you? Because like Jim said earlier, you know, otherwise it's kind of like, what are we doing there for? What are we there for? Is it? Needs to be closer. Yeah. <laughs> trying to see, trying to talk and see everybody at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, we can pass that. Around. So, uh, yeah. So you have to set client expectations. You got to put it out there, even if they don't read it. Okay. They're going to read it. They're not going to read it. They're going to sign it. Um, I did have a typo in my contract. Shame on me. I had asses. <laughs> Another inspector told me about it when he wanted a copy of my contract to see what he needed to put in his contract. And he actually read it and said, Jim, 
This says asses, it doesn't say assess. It's like, oh, let me fix that right now. <laughs> um, and there's, I think everybody has the limitation of liability clause. And back when I was with Home Pro and we used to pay for report, this was an older house, uh, probably 60s, and this would have been in the 80s. So the HVAC system was original to the house, close to 30 years old. The, uh, I just remember that the compressor, the condenser outside had two compressors, two fans. Big mother, dead of winter, wants to turn the heat on, she starts messing with the thermostat, turns on the AC. <laughs> Thing ran like a champ, no problem. <laughs> Anyhow, the buyer was an attorney. He didn't like, uh, the fact that I wasn't going to warranty everything in the house. I'm like, well, I can't do that. You know, I'm only charging you like hundreds of dollars and all these appliances are worth tens of thousands, even back then. He said, well, a contract. I thought about it for a minute and I said, probably somewhere between 25 and 50,000. If I have to think about, maybe I got to replace all this stuff for you. Yeah, he signed the contract. I did the inspection. Inclusions, okay? You gotta know all this, and this should be in your contract. Um, this is Virginia law. You're breaking the law. Um, but it also helps set client expectations. Ashy, go ahead. I need to back up. Yeah, so when this happened at Bronson, Deepor said electronic signature was okay, but the investigator didn't like it. But I think, yeah, right. Yeah, it's legal in Virginia and Maryland. And so the, um, the thing that, that was tricky with that is because, you know, he's sitting there. You got the investigator that's arguing with him. He's the one that's going to complain. But the thing to remember is it goes from the investigator over to the deport board, and they're able to see also. And so, they, and so if the investigator is wrong, this is like arguing with a cop. Wait, and you go to the right. You go right. You go to the right place to do the <laughs> argument, right? So you say, okay, I understand, but this is this is this is legal in Virginia. So um, yeah, just go ahead and pass it on to deport, and that that's what I do. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully none of you ever get a complaint. It's pretty brutal from what I've heard. Then Ashley also has stuff. Report, provide the client, blah, blah. This is pretty general. Uh, things that aren't functioning properly, significantly deficient, unsafe, near the end of their service lives. Now, Ashley does put that in. So what are you doing with that part of it near the end of their service lives? How do you know? You don't know. You can say that based, there's average service life. We should all know what that is. And it varies. Some people look at a furnace 10, 15 years. Some people look at furnace 15 to 20 years, water heater, eight to 12, water heater, 10 to 15. In reality, I think most heaters last close to 20 or maybe 20 years, some of them a few more. Um, furnaces, I think probably 10 to 15, most of them last close to 20. Air conditioners, probably 10 to 15. But I'm not gonna say that this furnace has five years left or 10 years left, no, no. Um, 
near the end of expected service life or typical service life expected typical you can add a word in there that changes the meaning of that statement um monitor for future correction no no don't tell anybody to monitor anything number one you're not going to do it just don't monitor for anything i don't know why that's even in ashy at all it shouldn't be there um not required to determine methods materials cost of correction it's a good thing explanation as to the nature of deficiencies that are not self-evident um, systems and components designated for inspection in this standard that were present at the time of the home inspection but were not inspected and the reasons they were not inspected. So how many of you open an attic hatch and you got this much white fluffy stuff up there, or this much cellulose up there, and actually climb up into the attic and start walking through it? Anybody? Well, at some point I figured out it's better to not walk through, change anything in a house that you're inspecting. Installation. However, what happens when you're trying to see other parts of the attic and, and now, you know, you've got a leak because of what we saw with Ruben, you know, there's a disconnected, you know, a bathroom vent or maybe, you know, something hadn't been sealed properly and then you have moisture issues, but you weren't able to see it because it was at the other end of the attic. That's just a challenge that we have to face. But then that goes in the report that the attic was viewed from the hatch you didn't you didn't traverse the attic you didn't go through it and limited by areas that were inaccessible so as long as you have everything in the report you're okay um i'm pretty sure my contract says that areas limited by insulation you know won't won't get inspected um and that's certainly in the report that limitation is in there for structure for attics you know pretty much everything you know you just can't get to it well Ruben's a lot younger than I am and I used to go climb into these attics like monkey through the forest up there in the trusses you know way above everything god I had one house in had one house over there in Potomac somewhere in Great Falls, somewhere over there, big old long, wide rambling house. I climbed up in the master bedroom and got up in there and went all the way across and came down in the garage, came down the garage way over there at a different level. So I was up there and I got down there and I got down. Thing was huge. Would I do that today? Probably not. Um, so when you're up there, be careful. I have heard of a few guys going through a ceiling in the last 30 some years. Um, and I myself had a close call in Mount Vernon area, Mount Vernon area. I just, it was just a misstep. And I heard a pop. And the realtor, it's a vacant house, the realtor heard the pop. I go back. <laughs> get back out of the attic go down the ladder look at the ceiling it looks perfectly fine there's no sign of a nail head there's no crack there's no nothing i'm like we're good to go here <laughs> but that's the closest i've come i've heard of a number of guys who've stepped through a ceiling so you got to be careful if you're going to go up in those attics um virginia inspect the condition of and describe in writing the composition or characteristics of the following readily accessible components 
and readily observable defects, except as may be limited in the home inspection contract or agreement. There you go, right there. What's it limited by? Insulation. That can be your foundation wall. It can be the far end of the attic. And I think Ruben's leaky furnace flue was in the basement and his bathroom fan was in the attic. So yeah, you could end up with some damage from a bathroom fan, kitchen fan, whatever, blowing against some OSB. It wouldn't be the end of the house. It wouldn't be the end of the world. A leaky furnace flew though, that would be a real problem. But it's right here, readily accessible components. I, I used to walk through the insulation all the time. And then I was, I don't know, one of the building scientists, Allison or Joe Stiverick or somebody said something about insulation and not disturb it. And I thought, you know what? They're probably right. Probably should not be doing this. There's no good way to fluff it back up once you smashed it. Just real quick on that previous one. Who here can tell me what's different about this versus ashy? What word is the biggest difference in here? No. Nope. Readily accessible, not representative number of. So that, that where, you know, some people will say, well, representative number, I checked one in each room. In Virginia, it's every one that you can actually get to. If you can get to it, you're supposed to inspect it. Do you ASHI guys know the ASHI standard for inspecting receptacles and windows? ASHI. Yeah. It, says, it says that, yeah, representative number. ASHI, ASHI does? Yep. And Virginia changed it and they said all readily accessible. Oh, because ASHI used to be one per, one of each per room. Yeah. So but yeah, representative they, number can be anything you make it. It's representative, right? It could still be one per room. Yep. And if you're doing a quickie inspection, you're going to do one per room. However, if you're working in Virginia, readily accessible, you know, if there was a window right here with something in front of it, I don't try to open it because you'll wreck your back in a heartbeat. You bend over a couch or kitchen counter or something to lift one of those windows that's stuck, don't do it. You will, you will tear your back up in a heartbeat. Other than that, uh, Crescent latches, walk over to the window, flip the latch, open the window. Houses with old crescent latches, usually wood windows, the top window's painted shut. You don't have to mess with it. What time? Is it quitting time? It's, 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 huh? It's, we lost a little time from the internet outage, but uh -huh. it's 12.30 now, so you got, so probably about 15 minutes. Okay. We'll be going over by 15 minutes then to cover for the uh, for the internet outage time. Okay, thanks. We'll zip through some more of this. The main thing is you need to know the Virginia law if you're working in Virginia. Get all this stuff in your report. Maryland's got different standards. You got if you work in Maryland, you got to know that stuff. They've got. similar but different than Virginia and ashy. Just real quick for everybody working in Maryland, notice number five there, a disclosure in 14 point bold type that includes the following, I, um, double I and then triple I on the next page, it's required. Hey, if that's not in your report, you're not you're not following DLLR standards. You have to have that in your in your writing. Every single report. Fourteen point bold type. Yeah, you have to get that part right. Yeah, that's and on a lot of the software. It's kind of difficult to get it to there. Notice it goes to I, then double I, then triple I, then and then number four there, IV, right? And then you have um, and then if you have the presence of CSST, it's got different language than what Virginia has. 
Yeah. So just be aware of that. There's pages and pages and pages of this. There's a lot to know, but you're supposed to know it. Where's the part, Shane, about describing stairs? Uh, it's, on, it's actually right here. So right here. So hold on. So what it does is that this part, it says the shall inspect. If you go to the next page, see, it just says it shall inspect, right? When you go to the next page, it says describe. Notice in Virginia, they have describe and inspect on everything. So it, it, with stairs and countertops, countertops. And, and I mean, it even has the what kind of faucets do you have in the house? Because it says describe, all, describe and inspect all these. So it kind of gets to a point of like, what point do you have that balance where you're meeting what they need to meet, but not getting crazy with it. So at risk of getting slapped by some investigator in Richmond, if I ever get a complaint, I don't describe stairs. If there's a problem with riser heights, treads are too shallow, whatever. Yeah, that's going in the report. Stairs, concrete, stairs, metal, wood, what kind of wood? Open riser, closed riser, uh, spiral. There's all kinds of ways that you can describe stairs. I don't do it. Countertops, uh, stone, laminate, stainless steel, concrete, wood, butcher block, composite there's I mean, there's this world of stuff out there are you going to put it in your report silestone quartz is it man-made is it natural blah blah who cares is the countertop damaged is it loose that's what matters is there one? <laughs> and this got put in way way back when before licensing, when you could be certified in Virginia. And the guys who were involved in this were in Nova Ashi. And they're the ones who came up with this describe countertops, stairs, whatever else we got in there now. And Depor knows it's a problem. But the problem is, it's in the law. And changing a law is not easy. And nobody's going to bring forth a change to a law that's been there since 19, oh, when is certification, 93? I forget, a long time ago, long time ago. That law is not going to get changed. Depor is trying to figure out what to do with, with the wording of the law to make it so we don't get stuck with describing all this stuff. Because description of it doesn't do anything as far as the inspection's concern. So Jim, uh, we got a comment here from the yeah. remote audience. Um, so this guy's saying that his insurance company, Inspector Pro, warned him that he should, um, that they would only defend the Virginia standard of practice. Um, but let, me, let me just read it to you. My insurance, Inspector Pro, warned me they would only defend to the Virginia SOP in Virginia and not to mention ASHI in my contracts our reports as it would cause indefensible confusion. I believe, I'm sure that's true, and I believe it. And um, yeah, I've got all my inspection stuff says I'm a member of ASHI, but when it comes to the contract, it's Virginia, it's not ASHI, because I'm not doing my inspection to ASHI SOP. I have to do it to Virginia SOP. But yeah. So you don't want to mention ASHI SOP. So for those listening, that means something very specific there, right? If you do inspections in Virginia, DC, and Maryland, you're using three different SOPs. So that's three different contracts. Yeah. That's three different reports, that report 
formats that you're using, things like this. Yeah. So be aware if you use this, if you're using just one standard, you're going to get nailed. Yeah. Yeah. So DC, of course, being the Wild West, has no SOP. So in DC, you can use ASHI SOP. And you can have that in your contract or wherever you have. Yeah, this, you know, and ASHI's, ASHI has what's included. You can put that in the header of a section. What's not included, put that in the footer of a section, wherever you want to put it. It's right there in the report. And in Virginia, all this stuff that you have to include in the report is supposed to be in a certain size font. And I think it's 14 point. I don't remember. It was too big. I shrank it down to 10 point or 8 point or something. It's too small. If I ever get caught, they're going to nail me for that. But it is legible. You can read it. Even I can read it. Old eyes. It does complicate. How many of you? Most of you. How many of you work in Maryland? Some of you. So it's easier if you only work in one jurisdiction, obviously. DC kind of doesn't matter. Like I said, it's the Wild West. Done many, many, many inspections in DC. Um, I think they're interesting. So this is slide 68 of 104. That's how much of this, that's why I said this is a whole separate seminar. But just to give you an idea, you look at it real quick, real quickly. Inspector is not required to. This is part of ASHI's list. Virginia says only items specifically excluded in the contract. Boom, short and sweet. Um, Maryland, a little different than both the others. So it's different in the different jurisdictions. That's what you need to know. And you need to know what's in here, what you're supposed to inspect, what you're not supposed to inspect, what you're supposed to tell the client about inspecting it. It's all important. Now, I will say, they both have stuff about CSST. And Ruben's slide this morning, even though he had the, what's that stuff called? Uh, Counter-Strike? Something like that, the black-covered coated black -covered CSST. Counter-Strike or some version of it. He showed a picture at the exterior of the house with about that much of the tubing exposed, stainless steel tubing. I don't care what kind of covering it's got. As far as I know, none of that tubing can be exposed outside. It has to be wrapped with self-fusing silicone tape. But Virginia, of course, as Ruben pointed out, there's a statement that you have to put in your report. And it says, my report says, this statement is required by the state of Virginia. Maryland has their own, and theirs is they're yelling. It's all in caps here. <laughs> and it's, it basically says the same thing, except Virginia says, should be determined by a contractor licensed to perform the work in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Who is a licensed contractor to do electricals? This is electrical stuff, folks. This is not plumbing. It's electrical that's attached to plumbing. Um, so it would be an electrician. And Maryland says, can be determined only by a licensed master electrician, okay? I hope all of you know how to look at CSST and tell if it's properly bonded or not. I hope. Any, any questions? Okay, good. Um, just a couple of years ago, I inspected a brand new multi-million dollar home in Arlington. And whoever was doing the work was not, I'm sure, was not a master electrician. May have had a license. Somebody had a license somewhere. The bond clamp was on the gas company side of the meter. 
The bond wire coming from inside from the panel was too short to extend to the customer side of the meter, which was <laughs> so I'm like, okay, just pull a new wire. Um, I hope all of you know what the little wire on the gas pipe is for. That's a tracer wire. So they can find the plastic pipe in the ground. It's plastic. That's why they can't bond it to the gas company side of the meter. It's this plastic pipe. Wouldn't do any good. There are pages and pages and pages to go through that we're not going to go through. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Are you Virginia inspector? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had this. So this document, this document is available for, to Nova Ashy You're members Nova Ashy. on the Nova Ashy website. You're not Nova Ashy. Um, this is on the Virginia website. No, no, this is not. This is Shane's, but the stuff here for Virginia is on the Virginia website. Yeah, so yes, it's all there. And you have to check that you have to check that periodically because they the law changes. When the smoke detector stuff comes into the law, the law is going to change and you have to change that. There'll be a statement you'll have to put in your contract. And then Shane will update yeah, the document, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> so what I what it is is you want to subscribe to the Virginia Town Hall. So what they um so when there's the deport meetings, you get notified. If there's an update to Virginia regulation, you'll get notified through email on this. Yeah. Um, but what this is, is this was a document I put together and I put it out there. We did a training on it quite a few years ago, but I put it out there. It was a, the comparison of the three because there were so many people missing those different comparisons. Right. But it's all pulled right from the documents that are on the um, ASHI, Virginia, and Maryland sites. It just, it just, a way to make it so they're in a comparison line to line value. BAC, BAC, what number is it? I forget. Uh, it, uh, 18 D something. I thought it was 41, 14, 41. I forget. So there's this, yeah. I probably should have grabbed that um, URL for that. I'll try to look it up for you this afternoon. Actually, Douglas, the, the afternoon speaker might have that. Code of ethics. There's the ASHI code of ethics. Code of ethics, Virginia. There's the Virginia code of ethics. Um, you got to go with Virginia. ASHI's got some good stuff in it, um, but this is what you have to go by in Virginia. Um, Virginia code, it's 18 BAC 15 40, I believe is the section you're looking for. Um, and then there'll be a whole bunch of stuff after that, different numbers after that. Um, how many of you have, have had an agent offer to pay for an inspector? An agent offered to pay for an inspection. An agent offered to pay for an inspection. Or part of an inspection. C, the licensee shall not accept compensation from more than one interested party for the same service on the same property without the consent of all interested parties. So the agent wants to kick in a hundred bucks, wants to pay for the whole thing. The agent's writing the check. You have to stand there and look at the buyer and say, the agent wants to pay for you, write me a check for your inspection. Are you cool with that? You just got to clear it with it. The licensee shall not accept nor offer commissions or allowances directly or indirectly from other parties dealing with the client in connection with work for which the licensee is responsible. I'm out of time. 
So all these things that these inspectors are selling and getting a kickback for, uh, you know, probably not such a great idea. So we're going to end this here. Um, yeah. 18 BAC 15-40 is Virginia. Maryland probably has a number too, right? <laughs>